Hello, Bophiles. We are here with Jason Lichtenwalter, who is the professor of, of what English horn at the University of Colorado, along with Peter Cooper, and he plays English horn in the Colorado Symphony. I do. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for asking me to do this. I feel honored to be on your, your <laughs> role of videos now. <laughs> awesome. Um, so. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you got into the oboe, how you came to be at your present situation in the Colorado Symphony. Okay. Um, I grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and my father was a, a, a band director at a university. So my mom would cart us off to the concerts um, from the time my sister and I were small. And I started piano at a very young age, I think first grade, and I played all the way through my second year of college. So I was very serious about it. Um, but I started to go in seventh grade, and the reason why was because of going to those concerts with my dad. And we'd hear all the instruments uh, in the wind ensemble. And then this instrument with this very captivating sound would play. And I thought, what is that, what is that sound? And, and it was the oboe. And the, uh, the student that was playing at that time ended up being a student of the same teacher that I would have uh, once I started Obo. So uh, I really, you know, was very, very much admired her, her playing. Um, but that was the start for me, was hearing the oboe in the wind ensemble. And just when it came time to choose instruments, uh, my sister chose the flute and I chose the oboe. Um, and went through, and it's, it's funny because my, my teacher told me years later that after the first two years, she was going to tell my dad that I needed to quit and do something else, because <laughs> it just wasn't, it, I just wasn't taking to it. And then it was that summer, I remember taking lessons that summer and just being really gung ho about it and working through the book, and, and then starting in ninth grade when things really took off, and I started seeing a lot of progress. So. Um, then it came time to go to college, and um, I auditioned on both piano and oboe at that point, because I was serious about both. Um, ended up doing oboe at Oberlin with James Caldwell, um, and then went to Eastman with uh, Richard Kilmer after that. Um, after I left Eastman, I freelanced and did a lot of teaching in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for a couple years, two, four years, and then Things started happening for me, audition-wise. Um, I got to play principal oboe with Dallas Opera Orchestra for a little while, and then after that ended, I went straight to Honolulu to play. Um, I ended up playing everything in the section. My, my official job was uh, associate principal and second oboe, but I was also playing some English horn, so I was playing everything, which, which was hard, but also good. I was sitting in between uh, Scott Janish, an amazing Mac DeVos student uh, principal, and Lady Resnick, uh, a Woodham student from Curtis and English Horn. So I was, I was learning a ton sitting between the both of me in that amazing section. Yeah. And I was there for about, I think, three, three and a half years. And then um, it's funny because Lady and I, uh, Lady won the job here in Colorado and I was the runner up, and then she was only here for a year. And then she went to Los Angeles to do a lot of freelancing and stuff there and um, and then so I that's how I came here and I fortunately won the tenure track audition to stay so I've been here since then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Jason teaches at the University of Colorado Boulder during the year but during the summer he has a really cool um, gig. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I teach uh, oboe for the the junior artist seminar at Rocky Ridge which is literally on the on uh, Long's Peak a 14,000 foot mountain uh, near Estes Park, up the way, here from Boulder. And then um, for the Young Artist Seminar right after the college camp, um, I teach along with my colleague Peter Cooper. Um, we, the students have, uh, each have two lessons a week. So they have one lesson with him uh, during the Young Artist Seminar for the, that college camp, and then they have another lesson with me. Um, so with me, they can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's been great. A lot of people have been wanting to do English horn while they've been there. So that's been fantastic. Um, but I tell them, you know, same thing as here at CU Boulder. Um, I just tell them whatever you want to work on. Uh, when they work with Peter at, at Young Artist Seminar, they're learning a piece that they're going to 
uh, perform at the end of the camp on a final recital. So their course of study is, is pretty set. And so since they have the opportunity to work with both of us, um, I tell them, whatever you, if you want to do English horn excerpts, we can. If you want to do an English horn solo, um, if you want to do another oboe solo, you can. Um, it's all up to them. But yeah, it's, it's a really great place. Um, it has cabins. Um, it's, it's very rustic, um, but it, it's, a, it's a really special place. And um, yeah, so I, this will be my third year to do the high school camp, the junior artist seminar, and then this will be our Peter my 10th year to do oh, the young artist seminar. Yeah. So uh, if you want to check out the uh, summer at Rocky Ridge, is what it's called? Yes. Uh, this music program for the summer, it sounds really cool. So like, I don't know if you're in the right age group, Definitely check it out. You get to work with awesome professors um, sitting beside me. And the deadline is coming up, I think it's February 15. Is it? The main one is February 15. Okay, so yes. main deadline, February 15. Uh, I'll put a link in the description below and up here in the corner. So uh, check it out. Right. Awesome. Thank you for telling us so much about uh, your path to the Colorado Symphony. Could you talk a little bit about what it was like to study with uh, James Caldwell at Overland? Um, that, was, that was an amazing experience. Um, I would say he was a very hands-off kind of teacher, which means that you didn't get a lot of extra time with him, but the time you did have with him um, was very meaningful. And I feel like he really made me understand the mechanics of phrasing. And uh, it was very much, he taught very much in that Curtis way of the numbering system um, of shaping the phrase. Um, and we played, some people can't, believe this is true, but it is. We played Barrett for absolutely everything. So the only time we actually played real music literature was when we did a, a recital. Oh, wow. And so for juries, we played, we played Barrett. But he, he was a very interesting, extremely intelligent man. And he, in his backyard and also on his desk uh, in his studio at Oberlin, he, he had bonsai trees. And he had this very kind of zen-like um, approach to things. He actually would make all of the incoming freshmen read Zen and the Art of Archery. Mm -hmm. And it, he just had this, this uh, way of teaching where he would, he would teach you the concepts and then you applied them to whatever music you were going to play. Mm -hmm. And I know some people don't like that. They feel like uh, the goal is you got you know, you to play this piece and this piece and this piece. Um, I actually liked it a lot uh, to do it that way because I felt like we got pretty much everything we needed to get. And then it was just a matter of applying that to whatever piece you were gonna play. Awesome. So it was, it was really great working with him, yeah. How was it different moving on to grad school with uh, Mr. Gilmore? <laughs> um, Mr. Gilmore's a very hands-on teacher, <laughs> that's what you would say, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, I met Mr. Kilmer at the, the Banff Festival uh, when I was at Oberlin. And I remember one day I was in the studio that we were using for lessons, um, but there were no lessons going on, but I was just practicing. And all of a sudden the door just flew open and he said, oh, Jason, it sounds good. You know, and it just it <laughs> threw me off guard because, uh, you know, he was coming to get something, but, you know, he, he'd been like listening yeah. and, and then he was, he was just, he took us out to eat. He did all this stuff that I know you're aware of from having been at Eastman, that he's just an incredibly um, hands-on teacher, that um, one, he would come to all the concerts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mr. Cobble didn't do that. So it's two different approaches, but um, I, I, both I thought were, were, were good. So you had a really hands-off experience with Cobble with a lot of like tool learning, and obviously uh, Mr. Kilmer is kind of the other way with that, very hands-on, very like in your life. Um, in your own teaching, how do you approach your relationship with your students? Uh, I, I want to say it's a little bit of a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, here at uh, University of Colorado Boulder, I'm basically an assistant to Peter, so I don't have as much contact with the students as he does, as being, he being the main teacher. Um, so what I tell all of the students each year um, is that I want them to think of me as their coach. Mm -hmm. And so whatever they want to work on, um, that's what we will do. Um, so if that's something that is complementing what Peter's doing in terms of 
they want to try some phrasing or something on a piece they're working on with him, I might do that. But a lot of it tends to be like, you know, if, uh, English horn help, right. since that's what I do in the orchestra or with the Colorado Symphony. So I would say the main gist of what I do here at CU Boulder is help the students with English horn. Um, but I'm also coaching some chamber music. So this semester I'm coaching um, the Hinesteria duo. Cool. Last semester I was doing trio. Uh, the semester before that it was a wooden quintet that was very gung ho, mm -hmm. and they were doing they did the tabula de Cupran. Cool. So. Yeah, so I'm kind of a guy with all kinds of hats here cool. at City Boulder. Awesome. Yeah. So are there any issues, especially for the English horn, that people who are not accustomed to playing English horn as full time um, need to be aware of in their fundamentals practice slash like warm up? Yeah, I would I would say that um, that the read because the English horn has a deeper sound. Mm -hmm. And I remember this when I was in high school and the first time I played English horn, the, I thought, oh, I love this sound. Yeah. You know, and it, it wasn't because I had this amazing read or anything. It's just everything just sounded better because it is lower and deeper. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, what can happen in that case is that the reads maybe not, don't get quite as finished mm -hmm. as, you, as you might do, say, for oboe, yeah. where we have to refine more in oboe to get you know, a, more, a nicer nicer tone or sound. But an English horn, I think uh, a, a common thing might be to just play the reed uh, without finishing it more because it tends to sound better already just because you're, you're deeper um, on the instrument. The other thing I think also is that um, for me, I am really well suited to the English horn because I'm 6'1 and I have long fingers. <laughs> so, you know, so when I play the English horn, it just feels, for lack of a better word, right okay. to me. Um, that's not the case for, for everybody. And I, I know a, a big complaint about people that have to play English horn who play oboe normally, regularly, mm -hmm. is that it feels so spread apart. Yeah. You know, so I, I would say another thing that people would have to get used to is the fact that your, your finger reach is gonna be uh, wider. Uh, the spread is gonna be greater because you, you're farther apart yeah. than you are in the oboe. So you might have to get used to that. I don't use a neck strap currently or, or, or any sort of assisting device. Uh, I know there's something that you can put around the bell and then it will actually uh, anchor to the floor. Oh, okay. um, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, there was a period of time where I was having a little bit of uh, right wrist trouble and so for a period of maybe a year or two I was wearing the neck strap and then I just it's in my case, um, but at, at this point in time, and this, is, this point in time has been quite a while now, I haven't used anything uh, to assist. Okay. But that's another thing that I think people who don't play English horn regularly might find uh, to be a little difficult, is that this thing definitely is heavier. Yeah. So. Um, um, how do you practice getting used to the voicing difference between the old English horn? That's a good question. Um, Again, because I, I feel like I have uh, a lot of space back here, mm -hmm. um, I feel like voicing for me in the English horn just feels kind of natural. Um, but I think for people where it's not, I think one note that, that tends to show up on English horn um, that might not be voiced as well as it could be is the half whole D. Sometimes it can sound really out of focus. Yeah. <laughs> about um, changing the shape in the back here so that it comes up a little bit yeah. so that it has more focus to it because when I've taped myself playing things and it comes back sometimes I would hear that on the half hole D on English horn mm -hmm. that it sounds it sounds a little spread yeah or almost like it's sitting down and so then I realized okay I wasn't thinking about uh, focus on that note yeah so um, I have struggled with that D have you yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, kind of, kind of recently has been like an obsession. Um, yeah, so I'm glad that you said that. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Caldwell talked a lot about voicing, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've done some lessons with Elaine DeVos, and she talks about that a lot too. Um, he talked about it in the terms of using vowel sounds in the yeah. back of your throat, so that um, he didn't, he didn't like. Oh, he felt like that was way too open mm -hmm. back here. Um, so he 
um, the syllable he liked the most was was U for like uh, just regular playing, mm -hmm. and then it would change to E the higher you went. Okay. Um, but I know Elaine DeVos talks about it in terms of raising the back of the tongue, mm -hmm. and she'll say the that if you say the word young and then kind of chop off the first part and go ung, um, ung, um, it's the same thing that it raises. They actually both use the exact same um, phraseology to describe this kind of focus, okay. and it's thumb over the garden hose. Right. So, and I actually remember Mr. Caldwell talking about that my very first lesson at okay. Oberlin was thumb over the garden hose yeah. and how that, changing the shape in that way, just like you would do here, gives an incredible amount of focus to, to your playing. So the difference of very unfocused. A lot of focus. Yeah. Try it, see what you think of that. that yeah. Right? So that it, and you really notice it on that that half hole D. So focusing that half hole D yeah. is the key. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about your audition experience and how you would prepare for auditions, mm -hmm. slash, you know, pro tips? Yeah, I, I will say that taking audition from here at altitude is something I found to be really difficult because you're the odd person out going to an audition where everyone else is, has reads that they've probably um, they're seasoned reads, you know, that, that they've kind of been nursing along, like they know that's probably the one they're going to use. And coming from here, um, in some ways, I almost think like it's harder going down in altitude because coming up, like when I came here to audition, you know, everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's trying to make a read that works, and you know that you're just going to be scraping and scraping and scraping, trying to get more vibration. And everyone's going to be doing that, right? Yeah. As opposed to the other way, where Everyone's used to their reads because they're, they're already at low altitude. And then if you're coming down to low altitude from high altitude, all of a sudden everything's just vibrating a lot more. And you're coming from a place where you're used to just taking a lot of cane off because that's what you have to do here to get things to vibrate. So in that sense, it wasn't something that I was thinking about in terms of taking an audition from here. Um, and that was kind of a rude awakening as far as, and because also, I also, it's, it's not a situation where you have the liberty of time to take like two weeks off to try and, <laughs> you know, so you just have to, I did take an audition one time and played really, really well on a read I made here, which surprised the heck out of me. I never thought that would happen. And I wasn't planning on, like, this is a read I'm going to use. Um, I was having a, I was going through a period of time where everything in the tip was cracking. So I had made all these reads ahead of time um, and just tried to make them a little bit sharp. So I was going to counterbalance the act, uh, uh, altitude difference. Mm -hmm. um, and everything was cracking. So I'm like, okay, I've got to go to good plan B here. So um, I found in my case, because I, I took some reads from here, that's kind of what I, it's, it's become something I've learned. I just, wherever I'm going um, from here, I'll just take a bunch of different kinds of reads. So I'll take some blanks, I'll take cane to tie, I'll take or some reads I've made here. Um, I'm not expecting they're going to be as stable as I want them to be, but it, like that one read, it just was... Just, it must have been an amazing piece of cane, is what I'm thinking, because oh, okay. it allowed me to um, to work on it, and it and I ended up playing a really great round on it. Which, if someone had told me I was going to be doing that, I never would have thought that would be possible. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I actually heard about um, your you came to do a class. Uh, I think it might have been a pedagogy class where you talked about um, like daily fundamental work. Oh, oh, here at CU Boulder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. What is something yeah. that you do or recommend people do when they're trying to like level up their playing? Uh, not on like an immediate scale, but on like a day-to-day -day grind scale. Um, my de facto answer would be long tones. Long tones. Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like, kind of like the way Mr. Caldwell taught, which, you know, we played Barrett for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like you can do absolutely everything, you can work on absolutely everything with your long tones. 
because there, there can be variations of it then. But it can progress from you know, how the note starts to, the, to getting the dynamic range and coming back to then that morphs into, okay, you're mimicking the shape you want to create with the phrase. Mm -hmm. So I know John Ferrillo has a wonderful exercise where you play a phrase just on one note. Mm -hmm. And I love this exercise. <laughs> um, because uh, I remember Kathy Greenbank saying, um, I had the great fortune to do some lessons with her at Aspen when she was still there. I studied with her for a few of the lessons and then Mr. Delancey for the others. And um, I remember her talking about that the notes are just the given, right? But it's the, what you do with the shape of that phrase of, of those notes is, is like the icing on the cake. And so if we think about it in terms of a long tone, that's how you, you add that extra life to that phrase uh, beyond just the intervals and, and uh, intervals that create the melody. Um, so that, that to me was a, was a really big influence. Um, and then to have John Ferrillo talk about it in terms of playing a note on uh, a phrase on just one note as a way to see what you're really doing with the shaping. So I really, I really like that concept. Mm. Cool. So. Thank you so much for teaching us about that. It's awesome. <laughs> so Jason plays English horn in the Colorado Symphony again, and uh, I just heard him play La Mer, and it was amazing. Um, I can cut this if you don't want to do it. But could you play the second movement solo, the first one? Oh, okay. It's like my favorite one. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Um, as always, if you want more Oboe videos or want to hang out in Oboe Files land, don't forget to subscribe and like the video below. We'll see you next time with more Oboe Files. Thanks a lot. Thank so you. awesome. Cool.